Welcome to this session on quantum script analysis. In this session, we have four talks. The first is entitled Quantum Attacks on Hash Construction with Low Quantum Random Access Memory. The authors are Xiaoyang Dong, Shen Li, Feng Fa, and Guo Yan Zhang. Uh, Shen Li will give the presentation. Thanks, Denton, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I would like to introduce our work on quantum attacks on hash construction with low quantum random access memory, which is a joint work with Chaoyang Dong, Feng Fan, and Bo Yanzhang. For cryptographic hash functions, H maps any bit string to an M bit digest. There are several security levels. First one is pre image resistant, that given the hash value Y, it's difficult to find the message X such that hash X equals to Y. And the second pre image resistance, that given the hash value HX prime, it's difficult to find the message X, X different with X prime such that HX equal to HX prime. And the collision is system that is difficult to find two messages, X and X prime, such as HX equals to HX prime. The difficulty is based on the generic algorithm to break them. For pre-image and second pre-image resistance, a generic algorithm requires two to the n time capacity to find the message x. For collision resistance, the generic algorithm requires two to the n over two time capacity to find the messages x and x prime. There are another security level which is called chosen packet force prefix for image resistance. The adversary has the liberty to choose any hash value y in step one. And in response, the challenger selects a message prefix p in step two. Then it's difficult for the adversary to find a shift flow net prefix s, such as hp concatenated with s equals to y. For iterated hash functions, Kelsey and Connell proposed a generic algorithm requiring time capacity of 2 to the 2 and over 3, which is known as curving attack. Here is a summary of our results. We have worked on iterated hash functions, XOR hash functions, concatenate hash functions, hash parties, and zebra hash. Um, curving attack, pre-image attack, collision attack, Due to the time limit, I will introduce two attacks only. The first one, quantum herding attack on iterated hash without q range. I'm showing the figure in step one. We build a totally k diamond structure to make the uh, most significant bits of f9 to be zero and store the diamond in B with hash from memory. In step two, we calculate the change in hash value x from the given prefix p by the challenger. In step three, we find the single block message m link to connect x with some value xj belongs to the diamond structure b. And in the last step, we will check the diamond for message blocks mj linking xj to xt and output the message M to the concatenation of P, M link, and MJ. The step one and the step three have been, have been adaptively modified in compared to the paper of Asia Group 2022, incorporating quantum algorithm, especially quantum collision algorithm, 
as outlined in the issue group 2017 paper. The, the quantum region finding algorithm is modified to eliminate the necessity of quantum random quantum memory. So for adaptive modification to step one, we first choose the first layer with the restriction um, R0 and at B. That is we start with 23S lib nodes with R0 bit surface R0s. Note so that the lib nodes with R0 0S surface are not relevant to this diamond building algorithm. After a diamond is built, Whose lives are surface with are zero zeros, we can apply a quantum finding algorithm, quantum collision finding algorithm to find a linking message for the digest like to one of those lives. And then we compute the hash values of upper half with restrictions on R1 MSD. To do this, we have three steps. The first step was for each node XSI in the upper half, we run robust algorithm by the MJ, so that the M1 MSDs of the hash, function, hash values of MJ and XSI are zeros. And then we repeat about step 2 to the L over 2 to the S minus 1 times to obtain a list Y of 2 to the L hash values to make the R1 MSDs are zeros. Then we for each node belongs to lower half. We apply a CNS algorithm to find a message block M prime so that the hash value hits one of the entry of Y and delete the colliding node from upper half. After that, we add new values for Y from the upper half to to maintain the sign of Y to be to the real again. Let me repeat the procedure to make all nodes in the upper half and lower half could be paired. So that the, the first layer could be built. And we repeat the procedure for this layer from layer to layer until the loop node, then the diamond could be built. For adaptive modification to step three, to which is to find the linking message and link by applying the variants of variants of CNS type collision finding algorithm. As in step one, we already have the diamond structure in classical memory L. We could define the SRH to be the set of message to make the hash value of M and the chaining value X bar has, has R bit suffix to be zeros. And also FLH to be the green function to take the values one, if and only if the message block will lead to one of the nodes in the diamond structure. Otherwise, it will take the values zero. After that, we could apply quantum amplification algorithm with global iterations. We could find the M link. So we have the step one, step three. The time complexity in step one is 232M plus 4K over 5, along with classical memory, 233M plus 2K over 5. And in step three, the time complexity is 233M minus R minus A over 2 times 233R over 2 plus 2K, which is optimized as R equals to 2K. The time complexity is 233M minus K over 2, and the memory complexity is 233K classical memory. So the best case time complexity is, is obtained when k equals to n over 13, i equals to 2n over 13. The time complexity of step one and step three is balanced. And the overall time complexity is 2 to the 6 n over 13, along with 2 to the 3 n over 13 classical value. The second attack is pre-image attack of XOR combiner. Given XOR combiner H1, H2, and the target value of E, Lurent and Wong invented the interchange structure to a classical attack with time complexity of 
through points A3 to N, combining with the middle, in the middle approach using the interchange structure and the middle. For quantum adaption, in step one, we built a bit build a switch from AIPK to AIPK, such as H1 AJ M hat equals to H1 AI M hat prime and H2 BK M hat equals to H2 BK M hat prime. To do this, firstly we apply CNS algorithm to search for two to the D multi regions. It requires time two to the two and all five. This classical memory to the end of five and content random access classical memory times n. Let me apply Grover's algorithm to find two to the x message and find from the modern region list such as RMSB of H1 AJMI equals zero, requiring time to three x plus o r over two with classical memory to the x. And then we apply CS algorithm again to find the M head prime whose hash value and XI AI collides with one of the two to the X hash values above, requiring time to rest e to the N minus R F X equal over two times two to the power two plus two to the X. For this step, the optimum time complexity could be achieved when X equal to R over two equal to N over five and t equals to 4 and 5. The overall time capacity for build a single switch is 2 to the 2 and 5. And in step 2, we using the same, same method, in, in, we just using the step 1 to contest it, to build 2 to the 2 to the 3k quantum switches to build the 2 to the 2k, 2k in the change structure, which means that in the H1, we have a list size of 2 to the 2k, and the, in H2, we have size of 2 to the k, which requires in time 2 to the 3k plus 2 and over 5 with classical memory 2 to the n over 5. In step 3, we launch a mid in the middle procedure between these two lists. To find a message block M such as H1 AJM equals to H2 BIM XOR B, which requires time to do the N minus K over 2. The overall time complexity of step 2 and step 3 is 2 to the 3K plus 2 N over 5 plus 2 to the N minus K over 2. So we can achieve the Optimum time capacity when k equals to n over 35, and the overall time capacity is to be 70 n over 35. Actually, we have two two more variants for pre-image attack on x order binder. The second variant is focused on the to lower the QRAM usage. This third, this third is for the without content random access content memory. So the second attack, we are based on the MLS element distinguished algorithm. In step one, we prepare a balance in the change structure. Each side is 2 to 3K and store it in with 2 to 3K QRSDM. The time complexity is 2 to the 2k times 2 to the 2 and over 5. Then we utilize robust algorithm incorporating MBD's algorithm to assess whether a given message and resulting a collision. This determination necessitates a time complexity of 2 to the n over 2 minus k over 3, along with 2 to the 2k over 3, quantum random access quantum memory, and 2k. 2 to the k quantum random access classical memory and 2 to the k classical memory. Then the overall optimum time complexity to balance the time complexity of step one and step two is achieved when k equals to 2 to the 3n over 17 
and the over temperature equals to 217 and over 75. For the test without QRSQM, we are based on the golden collision binary algorithm. The first step is, same, is similar to the, the second variant. And the second step, we utilize Grover's algorithm coupled with the golden collision binary algorithm integration to identify a collision message within the list L1 and L2. And this variant costs a time complexity of 2 to the n over 2 minus k over 7, which corresponding to the KQRACM and to the n over 5 classical memory. So the overall optimum time complexity for both step 1 and step 2 is achieved when k equals to 7 n over 150. The overall time complexity is 2 to the 37 n over 75. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? So, may I ask uh, uh, the modified uh, the modified language you Yes, the, the arc that have a prefix uh, set to zero. Is this the meaning for reduce the memory? Yes, we are just uh, adaptively modified classical techniques using the quantum algorithm, like like Grover's algorithm, uh, quantum collision binary algorithm, yes algorithm, CS algorithm. Uh, so your modification is targeted to reduce the memory. Uh, the, the full attack is optimum to maintain the lowest time compact while we focus on the different memory model like in, in what is in some in some model in some attacks we, we consider only a pure ICM model like we could use only pure ICM memory and in some some case we only allow the class memory yeah. so memory to class is not the first priority. Actually, we are focused on some model and to lower this to the time complexity. Time complexity is the problem. Oh, okay. So, do you think it's still possible to modify, for example, the interchange structure to be more friendly for this quantum memory? So, maybe you can. Yes, maybe it's possible, but uh, we, we haven't thought such a such direction. Any other questions? Okay, if no other people have any questions, then we Our next talk is titled. On quantum secure compressing pseudo random function, the authors are Ritam Bumik, Bawa Koliaki, Jordan Essen, and uh, Ashwan Jack. And Jordan, they will do the presentation. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, okay. So uh, this talk. Uh, will be divided into four parts. First, we uh, will explain a bit uh, about the uh, given torch and compressing uh, PLS. Then, we will discuss uh, what are the two called PLS and three called PLS constructions. We explain the differences between them. And uh, in the last part, we will explain uh, our quantum proof. Uh, so, first, why did we start, decide to study compressing PLS? So indeed, the uh, block cycles are, uh, it can be seen at PLX of the birthday month, which in the classical sense means that the number of queries is, uh, is more than one of two to the n by two, and in the quantum sense, uh, two to the n by three. Moreover, we, uh, we, we know that if we take a two n bit uh, universal hash and we combine it with a two n bit to n bit uh, PLX, we can construct a message authenticating codes and authenticate encryption schemes in the classical sense. But what about the uh, quantum security? There's not a lot of research done about that yet. 
So uh, the first notable walk uh, in that direction was done by Rochelle in 2019, where they showed that this following construction um, LLWQ uh, is quantum uh, secure as long as the number of queries is small and quantum 2 to the n by 4, and the component functions f1, f2, and f3 are assumed to be random. Uh, uh, in the analysis, they use the, the variant of the zone risk of West Alpha to analyze the adversity. <laughs> Although we know that LWQ uses three internal theater force, so that raises two interesting questions. First, is there a quantum secure VR construction with only two theater force? And are there other quantum secure uh, construction with uh, three internal theater force? So in our work, we aim to answer these two questions. So our contributions are the following. First, we show that all constructions, which will define exactly what it means, with only two BRF internal cores are either classically or quantumly broken. Uh, secondly, we identify seven interesting quantum BRF uh, candidates involved three internal BRF cores, and we prove uh, the security of three of them. Uh, as long as in the quantum setting, as long as the number of words is more than quantum two to the n by four, and the internal components, the functions are assumed to be wrong. So, uh, the, what is the distinguishing game in that setting? So, in that setting, uh, we have access to uh, the, the distinguishing of the quantum algorithm that can also do a superposition queries, and uh, he has access to one of uh, two worlds. In the real world, he has access to a 2NB, 2NB function that internally calls several independent. And B2 and B2 uniform random functions. And uh, in the ideal world, he has uh, just access to 2 and B2 and B2 uniform random functions as well. Uh, moreover, in our setting, it, our setting is information theoretic, so all of the uniform random functions are unkeyed uh, unkey and have perfect randomness. Uh, so, in essence, the adversary makes Q queries to some secret order, either the first one F or the F star, and has to guess the good probability in which world he is. So next we uh, we, we um, classify uh, and talk about the two cordial constructions. So what exactly formally mean, it means the two cordial constructions? So the generic construction has three linear layers, L1, L2, and L3. And between them, we have uh, uh, two pair of cores, F1 and F2. Uh, and in this work, we put a full classification of all the possible two core candidates and show that none of them is secure. Uh, so, for example, uh, for this simple construction uh, F1x, so F2y, uh, we can construct a classical distinguisher by just picking uh, x and x different than x prime and y different than y prime, such that uh, when you look at the output of, uh, of each of the pairs, uh, possible pairs, like so all of them is equal to zero. And because for a random function, this property holds with uh, a small probability. So um, for the uh, other constructions, we will have to rely on quantum distinguishers. So we will introduce uh, some uh, famous uh, quantum algorithm. So recall uh, that a periodic function is a function that such that for all inputs x, f of x, so s is equal to f x for some constant s that is a period. And Simon's algorithm just basically covers the given period s in O of n squares f. And we know that Simon's algorithm uh, works even when f is almost periodic, which means that except both except for some small subset of inputs with high probability. So since a random function is far from being periodic with high probability, Simon's algorithm can help us distinguish between uh, periodic functions and random functions. So for example, for this other uh, rather simple uh, construction, uh, f2 on f1 of x sub y, if we pick uh, two different uh, Inputs x and x prime, we can define the function gy, which is f of x y, so f of x prime y. And we notice that g is periodic with the period f1 x, so f1 x prime. So we can use Simon's algorithm to construct the efficient random distinguishers that can, be, that can uh, distinguish between the uh, construction. So uh, what about equal uh, constructions? So again, a three quarter construction is involves another linear layer and before that another BLF port. We do in our 
uh, table with what full specification, not going to show all the construction here. Uh, but this time, all up here, we can identify seven potentially maybe uh, quantum secure candidates. And in the in our role, we move the quantum security for field. So in this table, we can see the seven uh, candidates that we identified. If you look more closely in the table, we see that LLQ, LLWQ, and TNT uh, involve either at least amounts of memory, at least amounts of source, and some of them can also be capitalized. Uh, moreover, we know that this construction can be seen as with the permutation, if we see why it's doing, as long as F1, F2, and F3 are permutations. So in the rest of the talk, we will concentrate on these three construction and the quantum uh, proof on them. So for that, uh, I'll introduce the, the quantum proof framework. So a bit of historical context, usually in the classical sense, we will uh, have to uh, analyze transcripts. But in the quantum setting, it's a bit more difficult to generalize because of the non cloning theorem, which means that uh, you cannot clone uh, uh, a quantum state. In 2018, uh, Zondri proposed a complex order technique that might help in uh, constructing such force. And in 2019, Oshama and started using the compressed order in a good, that, good bad database setting. But the work is uh, mainly done in the computational basis, so it uh, means that the, means that the calculations are a bit long and difficult to understand. Okay. Luckily, in, in 2020, uh, Chung et al. introduced a new framework for using the complex algorithm in a more classical-like uh, arguments over the Julia basis, and I will extend Chung et al.'s framework to make uh, compact, indistinguishably with works that uses um, like classical counting system, more or less. So a very high level overview of our framework. So now 12 response pairs are stored in more of a quantum way in the database, which is like a transcript. We can define now bad databases uh, for each of the game field or and the other world as a, as a predicate of the, the query response pair. And we define something new, I mean, new query. Uh, it's the main tool of the, the work, which is called the transition capacity, which is a measure of the probability of the data that is going back after a single query. And the main idea is to show that the uh, good databases evolve identically in uh, either game, and we can bound the distinguishing advantage by looking at the cumulative transition capacity. So uh, um, I'll give a very high level uh, proof of PFP. So we we'll recall that the following construction in the figure is uh, uh, here, F1, F2, and F3 are NB random functions instantiated with the complex algorithm. So, uh, our initial goal is to bound the distinguishing advantage between a, a real world with the PNB construction and a 2NB, 2NB random function GID. But the Chung et al., so we will have to uh, track some component function, but the Chung et al. framework can only handle a single database. So, we have to create some more open so we define a function from three n plus two bits to n bits, such that uh, if the input starts with zero zero at f one, if the input starts with zero one at f two, if the input starts with one zero f three and one one g. Uh, we also note that now f one and f three and g can be independent. That's the main consideration. And moreover, we can replace g i d with some g i d star. Which also tracks the input for the last so the input for F3, which is the following formula. And luckily, GID to start with the random X1 for transmitted with X2. So uh, now uh, we have a single database that can track F1, F2, and F3 and GID start. Uh, in the real world, we you know DRE. The database that tracks F1, F2, and F3, and the idea world we call them TID, tracks F1, F2, and G stuff. Some notation on the setup, which is the for X1, the, the 3 and plus 2 uh, input that starts with 0, 0, X2 is 0, 1, and X3 is 1, 0, which is notation on the setup. And we can define uh, the set of uh, inputs for uh, the real databases and the real databases respectively. And 
the, 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 set, the sets of uh, all good databases and set of all good uh, uh, real world databases, no, the set of all real world databases and the set of all real. So, so now we can uh, define bad databases. So let me go back to the video to explain uh, the logic. So essentially what we want is just to avoid collisions on U3. So for that, we just choose uh, uh, to, to define the, uh, the bad database. We just uh, want to avoid uh, all uh, those uh, x1, x1 prime, x2, x2 prime, v2, v2 prime, such that they lead to the same U3. So formally, uh, formally, uh, we will do that, so in the real world, we have some v2 uh, so x2 equal to v2 prime so x2 prime so that we can find the v3 that uh, corresponds to that in the database. And the same thing can be done in the other uh, one. So uh, the next step, step two, would be to show that actually the good databases uh, uh, evolve identically in both worlds. So we define the set of good real world databases and good real world databases and note that for the good real world and good idea world databases, each U3 is associated with a unique input x1, x2. <laughs> so we can define the projection H that follows. So naturally for x1 and x2, we just map them naturally from the idea world, from the real world to the ideal world. And the interesting part for each x1, x2 and associated U3, we just take the real world U3 to the corresponding ideal world, the x1, x2 U3. So, uh, to finalize the proof, the main point of the proof is now to show that the cumulative uh, transition capacity uh, is bounded by uh, the desired bound, which is approximately uh, square root of q to the four divided into the end. Uh, and this uh, notation just means that if we start with the empty database, at some point we will end up in the bad database. So this is done by analyzing the effect of each. Each action, which is a, a component function on the transition capacity at each query. And from our framework, we can deduce uh, that the advantage is actually uh, upper bounded by the same bound. So for, for future work, uh, we think that our proof framework has the potential of developing it, go to a technique for doing quantum proofs for symmetric uh, constructions <clears throat> with one invitation that the proposed board uh, can only can only replace uh, PRF and not SDRP because it cannot end the inverse fault. Uh, luckily, a concurrent publication, uh, which is here, like, um, has proposed the uh, compressed uh, computation oracle uh, to resolve this issue, and uh, we're the working on integrating the uh, computation oracle into our both framework. Another direction would be to uh, get the tighter security uh, proofs, but it seems quite difficult. So, uh, just to conclude the talk, we show that construction involving two PLF internal calls are either a quantum or a classical attack on them. We identify seven interesting uh, quantum PLF candidates that involve three uh, internal PLF calls, and we put the uh, quantum security of three constructions, LRQ, LRQ, and DND, as long as the number of queries is small and quantum two to the n by four using our new framework. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. A nice chart. Um, do you want the main extension? Do you single call? Uh, we mainly looked at uh, two. I mean, uh, two and two and three. And two and the I don't know. I have to be in the body. I have to be in the body. Any other questions? Can I ask, uh, is there a direct application? Um, 
we think we might be so I mentioned we might be able to do a permutation because of the permutation model. I don't know, it's pretty new, so I don't know. Um, Previous walls? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are no other uh, security companies. I mean, optimally, it would be N by D, because that's, I think, the most essential. But uh, no, and we don't know how to do it. Okay. No, that's the same. Most of the this work is in the head of the head and table The resolving into into most different brain problems and the cryptanalysis of PSIH. And this work will be given by in Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk about a recent paper of hidden stabilizers that is need to avoid this brain problem and the cryptanalysis of PFAS. This is joint work with Mohamed Imra, Gabriel Ganas, Peter Kunas, and Tonello Hu at Bristol City. So here is the outline of my talk today. First, I will introduce the isogeny to anamorphic brain problem, which is the main interest of our paper and in short is ERP. And then I will introduce some necessary theoretical background. Then I will show you the road that we take that will approach the problem. Finally, I will explain how we resolve the problem and um, which is done by a sequence of reductions. So let E and E prime be two super singular elliptic curves over FP square, which are central objects in isogeny based cryptography. Um, the hardness assumption of almost all constructions in isogeny based cryptography can be reduced to the hardness of the following two problems. The first one is the advocacy ring problem, which says that. Given a super singular elliptic curve P, can you compute its anamorphism ring polynomial time? And the second one is the path finding problem, which says that if we have a small prime P and two super singular elliptic curves, how do you find the path from P to E prime on the super singular L as such a graph? And these two problems are shown to be equivalent. And an isogeny path on the super singular L as such a graph is essentially an isogeny of degree L power. So it's natural to wonder a more general and a simpler version of problem B. What if we only consider isogenies instead of L isogeny paths between E and E prime? Do we still have the equivalence between the two hard problems? The more difficult direction seems to be the following. What if we have the isogeny from E to E prime? Can we recover the anamorphism rings? Before we go into this direction, um, let's first define isogeny representation. This appeared in the pre previous slide, but I haven't introduced it yet. So an isogeny representation is a way to effectively represent the isogeny so that there is an efficient algorithm for evaluating the isogeny on given points. Examples include rational maps, which can be only used for small degree isogenies, unfortunately, and isogeny chain, but this can be also used only used for smooth degree isogenies. And then we have suborder representation. This is introduced in PSIP exchange in 2022, and it can be used to represent isogenies of large prime degrees. And very recently, we have high dimension representation, which is introduced after the SIDH attacks, and they can be used for arbitrary degree isogeny. So, in, so now, now let's formally define the problem we are interested in. 
is ERP problem. Let E, zero E be super singular elliptic curves over FT square, and phi from E zero to E be an isogeny of degree N. Given that morphism of ring and E zero, an isogeny representation of phi, we want to compute the morphism of ring of E. We already um, briefly introduced the motivation from theoretical side why we are interested in this problem. But in fact, this problem also lies behind the security assumptions of a recent construction, which is P size. Here is a simple diagram that explains P size peak change, which is very much like the SIDH diagram. So E0 is the public curve whose anamorphism ring is known. And phi from E0 to E is the secret isogeny of large prime degree N. Here phi is either phi A or phi B, and E is either E A or E B. That Alice or Bob computes. And S, which is either S A or S B, is the suborder representation of phi, which is the embedding of a suborder Z plus N times N E0 into the anamorphism ring of E, again either E A or E B, induced by phi A or phi B that allows Bob or Alice to compute the common term E sub A common B. So the assumption in P side is that even if Y is given with the information of the suborder representation, as A, for example, and Y is also given with the codomain term EA, it is still hard to recover that what is a ring of EA. This is exactly this ERP problem when N is a prime and when the representation is given as the suborder representation. So if we can solve the ERP, we can break P side. Okay, before I explain to you how we resolve this problem, um, let me first recall some theoretical background, which is the joint correspondence. It's a correspondence between the world of super singular elliptic curves and the world of quaternion algebra. So on the left, we have objects in super singular elliptic curve, elliptic curve world. For instance, we have the super singular generators over FP squared up to Galois conjugacy. This is in one to one correspondence with maximum orders with infinity, where the correspondence is done by taking the anamorphism ring. And we have isogenies from E0 to E, that's in one to one correspondence with integral ideals whose last order is the is anamorphic to the anamorphism ring of the domain curve, and the right order is isomorphic to the codomain curve of the isogeny. And if we have that anamorphism on E0, then that corresponds to your principal idea in the quaternion side. Finally, the degree of the isogeny corresponds to the norm of the corresponding quaternion height. And the principle in isogeny based cryptography is that everything is easier in the quaternion side. So, this is also how we resolve the ECRP problem. We try to push everything to the quaternion algebra side. So, how, how do we do that? Here is the roadmap. In order to resolve one problem, the ECRP, we introduce two more problems. So um, the green one is the short for group action evaluation problem. And the yellow one is the power smooth quaternion lifting problem. As you can see, eventually through the reductions, we um, finally live in the quaternion world. So we first make a reduction from ECRP to GAEP. In fact, it's um, two-sided arrows, so they are equivalent. And then we reduce GAEP to PQLP. Finally, we solve PQLP. So then uh, putting everything together, we resolve the ECRP. For the first reduction, we first need to define the uh, new problem we just introduced, the GAEP group action evaluation problem. So the group we consider is the general uh, linear group, GL2 T mod T. It acts naturally on the secret order n subgroups of z mod and z squared via the following formula. And because the n torsion of a uh, super singular elliptic curve when n is co prime to b, which is assumed throughout the talk, um, is isomorphic to z mod and z squared. So GL2 z mod and z also naturally acts on the secret subgroups of order n of 
E and E0. And finally, since such cyclic subgroups of order n corresponds to cyclic isogenies from E0 of degree n, then GL2, Z1, and Z also act on the last set of isogenies of a fixed degree n. So now we have the group action. We can define the group, group action evaluation formula. Let E0E be super singular elliptic curves so over FD squared and phi from E0 to E be an isogeny of degree n. Given the anamorphism ring of the first curve and its corresponding quaternion order, which is well defined via during correspondence, and a representation of phi and a group element, we want to find an isogeny representation of G star phi. So basically, we have the isogeny whose representation is known, and we take a group element and we want to know what's the um, what's the isogeny representation of the action of G on phi. In the context of P side, what does it mean? Recall that there, the isogeny representations are suborder representations which are given by embeddings. So basically, we know embeddings so, of um, suborders C plus N and E0 into the anamorphism ring of E. And we want to compute the embedding of the same order into the anamorphism ring of the following curve of G star phi. Okay, that's the definition of GAEP. How is that related to the uh, original problem ECRP? So the object that is playing a crucial role here is the stabilizer subgroup, where it's also in the title of the hidden stabilizers. So let's consider the action we just defined, and we define a stabilizer subgroup with respect to a particular isogeny phi. That is the set of matrices in GL to Z mod and C such that G acting on phi equals to phi. So what's special about stabilizer subgroup? Here is the proposition. So if we consider phi to be an isogeny of degree n, and then the stabilizer subgroup is the conjugate of the subgroup of upper triangular matrices. So it is a Borel subgroup of the general linear subgroup, GL2, Z1, and Z. Okay, that's some special property about the stabilizer subgroup. What, how does that help to solve the um, isomorphism ring problem, for instance? How is the stabilizer subgroup related to phi? As soon as we fix the basis of the n torsion subgroup of E0, we have the following isomorphism, which is n E0 mod n times n E0 cross is isomorphic to the um, group that we are considering GL to Z mod n Z, and we write the isomorphism by theta is sent to G sub theta. And here is another proposition about the stabilizer sub. So phi is again an isogeny of degree n stabilizer subgroup is made of the matrices G theta such that theta is in the angular order Z plus I phi where I phi is the ideal associated to, associated to phi under the theory correspondence. Here we are abusing notations by viewing theta as elements in um, the quaternion maximum order under this isomorphism. So this proposition basically says that if we know the stabilizer stuff, we can essentially recover the ideal corresponding to phi, and then we are pretty much done. So putting everything together, we um, have the main reduction. The ECRP redu reduces to the GAP quantum polynomial time. I do aware that I'm in a quantum group analysis session, and this is the first time I'm talking about this word quantum, so let's see. Um, so the problem is we know how to evaluate the action using our assumption, and the goal is to compute the anamorphism ring of. First, we use a quantum algorithm to compute the stabilizer subgroup in polynomial time. This is the Borel hidden subgroup problem in general linear groups. Um, for special cases where the general linear group is, for instance, GL to FP, 
can see it, there is a polynomial time quantum algorithm to uh, solve this, which is developed in 2010. And later in 2012, there is an algorithm that handles general linear group of the form GLN FPK. And in our work, we generalize the results to the uh, general gen general linear group GL2Z mod NZ for any n greater than one. Once we have the stabilizer group, we can recover the ideal corresponding to the isogeny value. And as I said, when I introduced theory correspondence, the anamorphism ring of E is isomorphic to the right order of this ideal, so we are done. So that's how we uh, achieve this quantum reduction. And as I mentioned, when we introduced the roadmap, that the reduction is actually double-sided. So the GAEP also reduces to the ECRP in classical polynomial time. And this reduction is purely uh, about quaternion algebra techniques. So I will skip this and also because this direction is not important for finally resolving ECRP. It's not going into the direction we need. Okay, that's all about the first reduction. Now we move on to the second reduction. Um, we introduced the final new problem, the power smooth quaternion knitting problem, PQLP. So it says that let O be a maximum order in P infinity given an integer n and an element sigma zero in O such that normal sigma zero and then are co prime. Find sigma, which is congruent to lambda times sigma zero mod n times O of power smooth norm with some lambda co prime to n. So this is the pure quaternion problem we want, and we wanted to reduce this ERP to this quaternion problem. Suppose we can solve this problem and let's apply the result to the special order O0, which is isomorphic to that of is a ring of E0. Then what do we get? Here we have um, a diagram which describes isomorphisms between three groups. Um, we have already seen, seen these isomorphisms, so I will not explain the, this diagram, but instead, let's look at these elements. Let's first take an element, G, inside the group. So we want to compute the action of this element on um, an isogeny. And this element corresponds to a quaternion element, right? That's the left side arrow. And because of PQLP, we assume we can resolve PQLP, then we can assume that this sigma in the quaternion world is an element with power smooth norm. And this element, again, corresponds to an element in the anamorphism ring. And the power smooth norm translates to that anamorphism means that the degree of that anamorphism is power smooth. Okay, let's remember the relations and the properties of these elements and move on to the next slide. Um, through the isomorphisms, we can see that the kernel of G star phi, where G star phi is the isogeny whose representation we are interested in. The kernel of this isogeny is equal to phi acting on kernel of theta acting on the kernel of phi. So now let's consider the following diagram, which is the usual SIDH diagram, where the, the kernel of the right isogeny equals to theta acting on kernel phi, which is exactly the kernel of the isogeny we're interested in. So basically, the isogeny on the right side of the commutative diagram is the isogeny G star phi. And the bottom isogeny has kernel phi acting on kernel of Theta. So our goal, remember that our goal is to compute the codomain curve of the right side isogeny, which is denoted as E prime. And we also want to know how to evaluate the right side isogeny. To compute the curve E prime and to evaluate G star phi, it suffices to know the bottom isogeny. Why? Because through this commutative diagram, if we know the bottom isogeny, we know it's codomain, and that's also E prime, right? So 
we know the photometer, and if we know how to uh, evaluate the bottom misogyny, then we know how to evaluate three edges in this commutative diagram. That implies we know how to evaluate the remaining edge. And we know how to evaluate the bottom misogyny exactly because degree of theta is power schools. So that means the kernel of the bottom misogyny is a subgroup of power smooth order. So we can um, compute the isogeny using the loose formula efficient. So that's why we wanted to solve PQLP problem. And that's why the power smooth condition is very important. Okay, then um, summarize the discussion just now. This is the theorem. The GAEP reduces to the PQLP in classical polynomial time. Finally, we explain how to resolve the PQLP. This is just another statement of the problem. And the key observation here is that it suffices to solve this problem for one maximum order for each given from P, even though this problem is stated for any maximum order in P infinity. The reason is essentially due to the fact that two maximum orders in DP infinity are connected by an ideal of power smooth form. So for the simplicity of the explanation, we just assume that P is a prime that's congruent to three mod four, then we take the maximum order to be the special one, Z um, adjoining I and J plus one over two, where I squared is equal to negative one, and j squared is equal to negative p. Let's denote the suborder zi by r. Without loss of generality, we can work within the suborder of rank 4 r plus rj inside o because this suborder is containing o with known index. Elements in r times j have power smooth splits as desired uh, in the PQLP problem by a result in 2014. But how do we leave a general element sigma zero in R plus Rj? The idea is the following. We first find an element in this full rank suborder R plus Rj such that normal gamma is power smooth. This is doable as long as normal gamma is big enough. And we try to find three elements alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 in Rj, such that sigma 0 is equal to the product sig alpha 1 times gamma times alpha 2 times gamma times alpha 3 mod n times O. And since alpha i's are in Rj, they can be lifted, and gamma is already, it has power smooth norm. So eventually, we can lift every component in the product and then multiply them together, then we can leave sigma zero. So that's how we resolve the PQLP. In conclusion, we resolve the PQLP and thus quantumly resolve the ECRP through the reductions we established earlier. However, there is one technical detail that um, we need then to be an odd integer with at most O log log P many factors. As an application, we break p side quantumly because in p side a is a large prime, and of course um, it satisfies the condition, the second item. Okay, so that's all I want to talk today. Thank you for your attention. Hi, um, that was very useful. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if this, um, you assume that you have a negative representation, right? Yes. I was wondering if instead of that, you have an oracle that allows you to evaluate points. Um, would that be able to work here, or would you need to have quantum access to that oracle to evaluate? Right? I'm not sure I understand um, the question. Yeah, I don't know if that makes much sense. So um, here you assume that you have a representation that yeah, allows you to evaluate. Yeah, you, you just need something that allows you to evaluate. Yeah, maybe an or. But do you need sort of like quantum access to this uh, algorithm that allows you to evaluate? Like basically, you need a superposition of quantum evaluations, or 
So you just need classical access. It's a uh, um, I'm not a quantum expert, so I, I, as you can see, how much quantum is contained in my talk. So I'm not sure I know the details. Thanks. Um, can I ask you one more stupid question? Um, how does it actually work when you said, because I mean, you said you have this, uh, the, the option of GL2 on, um, the, I, I mean, at the very beginning, you can apply the action of GL2 on um, Z mod N times Z mod N. Yeah. How does that translate to a like, single isogeny um, kernel generator? Yeah, I guess, like, how does the two if you, if you have an isogeny, then you have a kernel, right? Then you just, you just act the current uses as the use the GL2 element acting on that kernel, but you have to fix the basis, I think. Yeah, that's the meeting point. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If no question, I can do it again. I suppose the uh, intent of concrete analysis of quantum lattice in your enumeration, and they use the author by Shubai, Maria Lydia Wakam, Lloyd Joseph, and Tanya Lau, and uh, Jennifer Stern Wall, and uh, Maria. In the Alright. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Maya. I'll be presenting the first part. So, as you might be aware by now, uh, lattices are a very popular choice for post modern cryptography. And uh, generally, when we attack lattices generically, uh, so attacking the underlying problem and not the implementation, there are two popular families of attacks. First family of attacks is sitting type attacks. These are in practice and theory faster, but they require exponential space, uh, which is a lot. And quantity, uh, the speed up is not as good as we would like it to be. The alternative is Enumeration, which we'll be talking about today. Enumeration uh, is slower, but it uses only polynomial space as a trade off. And quantumly, we can get close to a square root speed up, which I'll detail today. Uh, most literature you'll find about these attacks are asymptotic attacks, uh, asymptotic literature. So, uh, generic, you don't no exact implementations. Uh, what we did in our work is uh, a concrete implementation of most parts of the quantum enumeration. Uh, in fact, so in 2013, Elof came up with the electrical circuit framework uh, for quantum random blocks. And this led to uh, the quantum backtrack algorithm. Uh, the one we'll be using today is by Montanero from 2018. And uh, this attack happens to fit very well uh, to enumeration. So around that time, uh, quantum enumeration attacks came up and they got a very good speed up. Uh, and our work will be giving uh, what, as far as we know, is the first concrete implementation of uh, Montanero's backtracking algorithm. And the first concrete quantum implementation of this, uh, of applying this enumeration. So quantum algorithms, we're in the quantum part, uh, but today there's not enough time to go into exact detail about the, the exact circuits, which is not enough time. Uh, so I'll be, we'll be trying to give a broad overview and get you an idea of what we're doing. So uh, quantum computers use qubits, quantum bits, and the, generally when we talk about qubits, uh, we talk about the space. 
So when we say space, we mean qubits. When we say qubits, we mean space. So to operate on these qubits, we apply quantum gates. Quantum gates uh, are a little different from regular gates, uh, like n and x4. Uh, but generally, there's one gate we like to measure by, the most uh, commonly used gate called the P gate. And efficiency uh, could be measured in a number of these P gates. And alternatively, when you want to look at the depth of the circuit, so with some parallelization, you look at the P depth. So when we talk about P depth, that in classically corresponds to the depth of the circuit. So uh, integration, here we have nice two-dimensional letters. Of course, in uh, for cryptographic purposes, there will be many more dimensions, but for seeing purposes, we only have two. And we have here the base of this uh, a base of this lens d1. So to do enumeration, you pick one direction, in this case d1, and then you look at the directions orthogonal to it. Uh, so then we project the other vector or other vectors onto this uh, orthogonal direction, and we get d2 star, which is projected onto the orthogonal plane of d1. And we make a grid of this uh, measured by the length of P2 star. And then we look at all the points uh, with the radius of P1. And then for each multiple of P2, we find all the length points uh, on the line. So 0 times P2, 1 times P2, 2 times P2, 2 times P2. Uh, then in two dimensions, you can now find the Shortest vector. In many dimensions, you would do this recursion. Um, so, if you look at this problem, you can look at it like a tree. Uh, the tree here is binary. Generally, the tree will be somewhat friendly at degree roughly uh, equal to the dimension. So, it will be a very, very big tree. Uh, oh, sorry. And, and then, if you do the tree search, in this tree, you can find the short vector just by doing a depth or a search. Uh, this it takes super exponential time, so we'd like to cut it down a little. So uh, we introduce backtracking. So to do backtracking, rather than going all the way down the tree and at the end deciding, okay, this is the, this is the right result, uh, or discarding the result, at every level, every node, we check, okay. Should we continue down here? Uh, the picture, again, a little bit optimistic. Uh, generally, you won't cut, it, cut down the tree that much, but you can, but generally, you will find much uh, improved results. Uh, and to, and on, as I said, on every level, we decide to continue down this path or not continue. We use an oracle, which we call the predicate. And uh, this generally is called vector. So we like to do this quantum leap, and quantum leap uh, by in Montanaro's idea uh, was splitting the tree into all and even distance nodes uh, for, from the root. Uh, and then in every step, we go over all uh, first of all the even distance nodes and their children. I'm a little bit vague here what going over means. Uh, uh, it's very quantum technical. Uh, we should have time for. And you go all the all distance nodes and the children, as well as the root five. Uh, so, what we did in our paper was give a quantum uh, circuit level implementation of this. Uh, and this step uh, overall we call RBRA. So, going over all the e even distance nodes of all distance nodes. Uh, so, then finally, uh, we would do phase estimation on that. If you're not familiar with that, don't worry. You don't need to know what that does. And uh, here, uh, yeah, this is what such a circuit would do. And at every step, you would repeatedly do the, these quantum backtracking steps going over the even and the bold distance. Um, all right, and now I'll hand things over to my co author to go into more detail.
Then for, I will continue the talk and I will talk about the certain design and the history of animation. So let's take a look to the overall picture. So if you go back to this picture, so we want to dial focus for the operator view, uh, where you equal to RPRA. So the inside the operator view, we have a basically B. So what is the role of B? So the role of B is next to our box is correct. And so what is the condition that we use inside the basically B? So for the predicate B, we just need to ensure that the coefficient uh, of the subject vector when we enumerate to satisfy this condition. So we call that when we talk about enumeration, we try to uh trust on other labs or this a multiple different multiple of uh, B2 in the example that made the discount before. So this way we say this is the, um, the enumerations and so the idea here is we will start to enumerate the end and then we do upward like the end the end minus one until one and then at this step we will check to make sure this condition is satisfied. Okay, so now I will introduce you what is the meaning of this term here. So here are in the enumeration values. Uh, normally it's like uh, sometimes you can uh, choose R uh, in like uh, the version of characters of the subject vector. And the mu i join here is just the coefficient of the radius orthogonalization. And b and the norm of dj star is just the norm of the orthogonal basis. And all of the three values we reproduce classically and we will use it uh, to design the circle. Okay, so Remember, in our circles, we need to make sure on other bi here, when we enumerate it, this is satisfied this condition. So this condition, we can separate it into four uh, smaller modules. Uh, but here is the picture of the basic circle. Uh, so first, uh, in the first module, we, uh, we can compute uh, mu i j times with bi. So here, um, Bi, they yeah, are integer. So the product between mu i j and bi is just a uh, multiple, integer multiple. And uh, we compute it and then we sum them together using the gate ak here. And the gate ak is defined recursively. And uh, like, for example, the gate a n minus 1 can be the result of the n. And here we can parallel this part because for the first step, this is uh this is integer multiple, so it's just repeat addition. And then for the sum for the summation, we just need to uh, define a binary tree after and after together. Okay, and then for the second model, we will uh have it. we will do the multiplication, the multiplication with the norm of the z star, and we also do the squaring to do it. We design a, a moon a game moon ff to do this part. Um and the last case is the addition uh, gate, the uh, RFF gate. And for this part, we can also parallelize and do binary matrix uh, at the to speed up the, the computation. Okay, so I just uh, give you an overall picture about the basically circuits. There's some requirement for this uh, circuit to design. Um, let me record uh, a little bit about some notation that we will do I will read out. So here n is the dimension of the lattice of the number of the i. And d is the maximum degree of the trees, and v here is the power of the coefficient. Okay, so the first thing here is for the enumeration algorithm itself. We need to do we need some plus more to make sure the enumeration is correct. Um and um okay. By some previous words, the plus involved for the enumeration uh, is going to be defined by p graph close to 0 by 3n. And so here, because this is a one of hard work, so we don't want to do plus involved because as, uh, as far as we know, the one circus for plus involved arithmetic is very expensive, so we will put one into this boy number. And um, so, to convert it, so we have to cross up. We, we will cross our small precision uh, and the final precision for 
for for elaboration and for this point number of elements, they use high line we equal to this formula. Here, um, I mean this may look complicated, but the first term log b is from step one log n is then from step two log, and then the uh constant for here is just for from squaring. Uh, the detail about how to build a vision shot is high paper. Okay, and then another some horizons we make uh, in our book here to mount uh, D and couple of these B. So in some brief, uh, so we know like three sides. So three sides is just the total number of possible trees. This is bounded by n to the power of n. And so the normal version is okay. So what is the value for D and couple of these B? So we said we we can see that when our basis is reprocessed. So it depends how closely uh, your reprocessed basis. Uh, like for example, in our case, the uh, SKZ review basis, uh, we can uh, we can assume that this is flow to and not a okay. Okay, that's it enough. Now we go we go to our you know, result. Okay. So overall, the resource estimate we tell it using C A and C star. Okay, this is a very long and tedious formula. So don't worry, we we, we also provide some practical um instrument uh for the resource estimate. So in normally for some table in in group therapy system, uh normally the sign of can be large, like bigger than four hundred. So we we model like it flow to n. Upper case B equals to N square, the precision is always bound by P N and the uh, side of the tree B bounded by C N log N. Okay. And um I will talk about how we can assume that data. Um but if we assume that is correct, then uh the P N and the T side will have this precision formula here. Okay. Okay. So and next. Um, we talk about the horizons that we do to to uh, achieve the beautiful formula for the dependency side here. So the first horizon is we believe in flow to n can be bounded by n square. So to do that, we will to uh, take some table from the SPV channels, and then uh, from that we can build a rational between d and n and b and n square. And we spot it here. So you can see that this ratio is balanced by the number two. So it's very make sense for the first horizon. Okay. So if you not believe me, uh, we also have another experiment uh, for the bound for B. So to do that, we will run a uh, uh, sample on a, uh, and use it, and we will sample uh, random letters with different dimensions. And then we do the uh to review it and to build the bound. And so we do, we actually, uh, and then we compare the result between the experiment and the result using the simulator. And then you can see like the result between the experiment and simulate simulation be they are much less other. And here, uh, the actual result that we use, uh, that we fit uh, the number sample here is just a uh, parameter. It's a slightly current situation. So we can say like it's gonna be like flow to lead in that work situation. So it makes sense to say like the value is flow to square. And the final horizons we do in the work is on other view IJ and it has a similar end field. We also run experiments on different uh, on different uh uh, random lattice, and then we do triple L to review it to build the the bit the the minimum of the mu ij and swap here, and then we also do BKT to review the method to build the mu ij and swap. Okay, so this is the end of our work, and after this work, we still have some open questions that I want to ask. So first, so the main um, part of Montana Road algorithm. Is like using phase estimation process, right? So the question here is how can you parallel it so you can achieve a better density in terms of C And the second question is what is the current result estimate for a trip running? So for this question, there is a, a, a previous work, the AMS 18 paper, they did provide some assumed sources uh, estimate for a trip running. 
uh, and then they do uh, binary tree converter for this one, but they have uh, underlying uh, some hidden costs that we, uh, I think we, we are not clear about that. So it's going to be interesting to see the risk result estimate for that. So thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, we are happy to answer. B here is the the base the orthogonal basis. Orthogonal basis. Yeah, the norm of the orthogonal basis. But then not. Yeah. But the norm and knowledge is the equation for random and for random basis. Has that two to zero? I mean, for random access, you will choose a random basis. Then set the solution to random access. Oh, okay. So this is um uh, this is for some okay. So maybe in general the value here is going to be maybe large, but if you uh, prefer set the basis, then you can you can reduce it. Okay. And uh, also, uh, which kind of basis just be your determinants? Oh, we just took the so for this experiment, uh, we just uh use the SPP challenge uh oracle to uh, generate random classes with different dimension. And for this dimension, we we have a sample like for example a hundred uh, uh a few instance up. For this dimension, and then we take the average. So, uh, your tiny is yes, that you give a complete analysis to the computer. So this is the final result that we get. Okay, and we get back to this side. So normally common scenario and algorithms. So the complete goals are in theory here. So this one will correct for parameters or if you want to need more broad. So this one. You might notice there's still some big O notation. That's because there's parts of the actual the implementation of the efficient algorithms that we weren't able to uh, replicate here over here how they were doing. Uh, we can we can implement a completely generic effect, but for the best case, uh, the best algorithms uh, we heard. Don't know how to implement it, especially in <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Thank you for the very good talk. Uh, I think the question whether uh, you looked at hybrid examples. Or relative of the field of the numbers would be this the final Again, the data? Um, so we don't have the, so we don't have the previous uh, number of Kyber. And I don't think Kyber I mean, in this case are going to be uh, affected by our result. So our result is just uh, like fill the gap between the Montenegro algorithm and ASS. And one more thing here is the last enumeration we do here is a very, very basic last enumeration. We didn't consider, uh, consider the distributed, so it should be like uh, prior to, 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 to just plug in the parameter for cyber in the historical field and get uh, the complexity here. So, I mean, after we have a uh, risk of resource estimate 
but to remediate interest in the benefits of the other streets to see what the other is benefiting. We were thinking that, uh, we were thinking about this question a lot, which is why we become the same. Thank you very much. Any other questions? If there is no question, then I will ask you to 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 ask you to